This podcast is a proud member of the Unidentified Network. So now, ladies and gentlemen, live and in color, it's Mr. Wayne Love Juice. The other day I produced a movie Had a cat with an interesting trappy People said that the YouTube algorithm Really aren't that happy If a channel only broadcasts once a week So we decided we could text ya Whatever we've got a piece of news In our new book on the track extra Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Downs. I'm the director of the Centre for Fortune Zoology, and welcome to another episode of On the Track. Now, I've got two very special guests with me in the studio today. One of them here, via the magic of my iPad, is my old friend, whom I have known for I think 35 years now, Mr. V. McCrinnan. Hello. Uh, and what are you here to do, V? I'm just uh, doing my thing, man. And I also have another guest for the first time, not on first time on the show, not hidden behind an image of himself smashing a computer. It's Computer Boy. Hurrah! Computer Boy, also known as our producer, Louis. Louis, why are you dressed like that? Well, I'm glad you've asked, John, because I am a master of disguises, and I am here, hidden in plain sight, with Lilith and Archie, who I now have under mind control, and I am using them to absorb massive amounts of data about this weird place they call Devon. I'm sorry, you can't be. You could have been doing that get away with talking about mind control if you'd had Peanut. Because Peanut is a boy. And it would have been mind control to neutered Tom. Hey everyone, we've got a great show for you today, but first, please check out this important campaign for Lars Thomas. Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name's John Downs, I'm the director of an organisation called the Centre for Fortune Zoology, which is the largest mystery animal research group in the English speaking world, and we like to think the best. We've been going now for over 30 years and in those three decades we have sometimes carried out campaigns to try to raise money for equipment or for expedition expenses. But one thing we never do is to raise money for ourselves because money is nowhere near as important as the search for expanding the boundaries of human knowledge, which is, at the risk of sounding horribly self-important, what this organisation is all about. However, we are a family in a very real sense, and there have been times over the years that we have made appeals to raise money for members of the CFZ family who are down on their luck. And this time, I want to tell you about my friend Lars Thomas. He was one of the earliest members of the Centre for Fortune Zoology back when, in 1994, we started publishing our magazine, Animals and Men. And I have known him, therefore, for 30 years this year, which is 
seems to be a remarkable length of time. He has recently become very ill and he's in a hospital, partially paralysed and not able to work or indeed do anything very much. And so Richard Freeman phoned me the other night and suggested that we do a crowdfunding exercise to try and raise some money for him while he is in such a dire straits. And so I had a word with Miss Guinevere and she went and set it all up. And you can read all about the appeal here at this link. What I would like to say, ladies and gentlemen, is that Lars is a very nice, sweet and kind man who's been very kind and generous to all of us over the years. And it's about time, I think, that the CFZ paid something back. Please dig deep in your pockets and do whatever you can to support this very worthwhile appeal. Well, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who are regular viewers of this show, and if not, why not? And if you continue this recalcitrance, I will set Mr. McQuinnon on you. <laughs> See, he sounds very fierce, as well as very manly. I am very manly indeed. Yes, you are. And I've known you for 35 years and you just get more manly there every day, with every year that passes, like a fine wine. Oh, thank you very much, sir. Guys, young people don't need manliness. We have metrosexuals. Men who like women and their skincare products. I thought it was people that did it on the railways underground. I am not sure how I Me keep on losing. Shut up, you two idiots! I'm losing control of my narrative here, and I'm meant to be the presenter. Sorry. Yes, so I would think. As regular viewers will remember, V and I presented a two part episode of On the Track Extra with tales from the Testudinae. I managed to say test you tonight without McCrinnan giggling because he thinks the word test you tonight sounds like testicle. And now the dog started barking. <laughs> test you tonight. Oh, Shut up all of you, including the dog. There must be something in the air at the moment because I've received a whole bunch more tales of the test student and I and so first of all we're going to go over to Miss Daisy who sent us this story. As we have just alluded to there is a distressing habit especially amongst the taxonomists who deal with the test judines that they take delight in changing the taxonomy around almost willy-nilly. For example, for centuries the family of soft-shelled turtles, and for those of you who don't know, a soft-shelled turtle is a freshwater family of aquatic turtles who have no scoots on their carapace, and the carapace and the where the carapace would be and the extended vertebrae are just covered with leathery skin. For centuries they were always known as the Trionyx family but now Trionyx has been replaced by all sorts of things and I have forgotten what this one is again because my memory is like a, the preserved proverbial sieve but the family with which we are going to deal today are the Pelochelidae. Let me just check I got it right. Pelochelis 
a genus of giant soft-shelled turtles. Well, there's four species of giant soft-shelled turtle. The one that is most familiar to cryptozoologists includes the fabled giant turtle of Hanoi, which lives in, which lived, because the last two have probably died now, in a lake in the middle of the city of Hanoi. However, if that species is actually called the Yangtze giant soft shot, <coughs> you try and say that even when you haven't had a few, the species is actually known as the Yangtze giant soft shot turtle because it was originally discovered in the Yangtze Kiang River complex in China. It is now, as we've just learned, found all over bits of Southeast Asia, but it is almost extinct. There are two or possibly three remaining alive in zoos, one in Vietnam and the other two in China. But over recent years, individual specimens of this species have been found lurking in lakes and river systems in Vietnam. And so I think especially as they can live for such an enormous length of time, I think it would be unwise to say that they are definitely going to be consigned to the Book of Extinct Animals. But the one we're going to be talking about today is Cantor's giant soft shell turtle, which is, I have to admit, a species that I really hadn't heard of, or hardly at all. And they, also known as the Asian giant soft-shelled turtle, were once found across quite a large swathe of Southeast Asia. But in recent years, it's got more and more and more rare. I'm sure there's a better word, less widespread, more rare. And it was even fairly recently thought to be extinct or functionally extinct because there were no known breeding grounds. Now, Daisy sent it to me, the news story, that at last a breeding ground, this is in a part of southwestern India, but finally a team of experts led by conservationists from the University of Portsmouth have found the first ever breed known breeding ground of this turtle. And it's great that once again Britain leads the world in conservation matters. I'm sure somebody's going to find that offensive. Goodness me, I can hear people banging on the window shouting about white privilege. Yes, of course, it's white privilege to be able to discover the breeding grounds of a highly endangered turtle. And I agree totally with Daisy, who sent it to me, saying this is something that we as British should be proud of. And Lord knows there are enough people telling us these days we're not supposed to be proud of what happens in Britain, but I think that having rediscovered the breeding grounds of the giant Asian soft gel turtle and made sure that with conservation method measures in place this turtle is not going to become extinct because there are I'm sure other cryptic breeding grounds of it over parts of Southeast Asia that this species is going to thrive for decades to come. Thank you for that story Daisy. I think it's absolutely fascinating and well done to everybody involved. My second story for this week isn't really a story because it hasn't actually happened yet. But the other day, after watching V's and my second show about Testud and I, Bob Skinner wrote and said, Do we want to have a story about a turtle in 1975 that managed to survive for a year, even though it was encased underneath concrete slabs. 
Apparently, it first appeared in the magazine Pursuit, and Bob, who is a wonderful man, is going to hunt it out for us so we can give you all the details. But this is something that we've not actually brought you in this show yet. It's the perennial Fortean fascination with animals, especially toads, which become entombed by accident or design and actually meant to survive for ludicrous lengths of time when they're encased in a tree or encased in stone, encased in coal or encased in concrete. There's even a story, which is almost certainly apocryphal, of a pterodactyl, of all things, which was apparently encased in a stone in a quarry in France and somebody banged the stone with a hammer it split in two and the pterodactyl flew away. There's absolutely no concrete, if I may use the pun, concrete evidence for this, but it is one of my favourite Fortean stories, even though it's probably complete and utter bunkum. We'll bring you Bob's story later on. Well, not late, later on, as in another episode, not in this one. But it's time for me and Mr. McCrinnan. Say hello, Mr. McCrinnan. Hello, Mr. McCrinnan. Oh, dear, 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 the old ones are the best, aren't they? It's time for me and Mr. McCrinnan and Mr. Louie, because for some reason Mr. Louie, who's still, even though the camera wasn't on him, still doing his best to look like a cross between a contract killer and that bloke out of South Park. His name's Kenny. Look it up. I don't know if I ever told you this, but Nick Redfern is an old friend of mine. He's just come back to England. We're going to be having him on the show very soon. Was right, we was writing a book about the Kennedy assassination and I tried to get him to call it Oh my God, they've killed Kennedy. For some reason, his publisher wouldn't let him do it, even though I still think it's really quite funny. Thank you very much for watching, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going. Mr. McCrinnan is going. And because he's off to America on Thursday, and we're not going to be seeing him for a while, unless he actually does that long-awaited... Um, live stream thing from the lake which is in his neck of the woods in South Carolina and has a um, alleged monster in it and him and his friend may even be teaming up with the lovely Katie Elizabeth to look for it ah. so I'm going to give my producer Louis the final word in this week's episode Thank you, John. That gives me a chance to practice my American accent. Hey, y'all, I'm going. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> there goes, there goes, thirty-five percent of our of our audience. I'll be seeing you.